another busy month in the world of marketing. Definitely some big hits, some misses, um, some controversies, and a ton of AI musings. Um, of course, this month I was joined by some amazing guests. And it, I will add links uh, in the show notes and of course you can see it in the newsletter uh, for my episodes with Peter Markey, CMO of Boots. Uh, I talked all things B2B with Andrew Hussiger of Green Hat. I covered culture with Dr. Marcus Collins. I talked branding with Mark Kingsley and I talked Trevor Cohn, Kira Grady and Trevor Hunt about sponsorships. So a uh, great month of uh, podcasts. Well, I'm going to start with something that I have been told and has been kind of said to me a couple of times now about That's What I Call Marketing. I love That's What I Call Marketing. I love this podcast. I love speaking to amazing marketers and engaging with so many people that seem to enjoy the podcast. But look, this isn't a full-time paying job for me. It has given me access to the best minds in marketing. And as a result of that, I've had to stay sharp and on top of the latest thinking. I genuinely think it has made me a better marketer. Yet I am still a marketer looking to find my next full-time role after redundancy. It has been a struggle. And I've been told that maybe people see the podcast and believe that it is my job. Look, I wish that was the case. And maybe there's somebody out there that sees a way for this to become part of, you know, a role and, you know, engaging with marketers. It definitely would be a great opportunity I'd be interested in. But this isn't my full-time job. It is my hobby and my pastime. So, what have I been doing? Well, I've been working on amazing projects. I've had an interim head of marketing role and I love that work, I really do. But I am looking for my next home, my next full-time gig. I love seeing projects through from start to finish. And as you can tell from my podcast, my experience is wide. I've done B2B, B2C, I've worked agency and client side. So. I thought it'd be useful to use this platform to make that clear to people. Uh, I am out there looking for my next marketing home. And if you are looking for somebody who loves marketing to join your team, you may know of roles coming up that you could refer me to. I would genuinely love your help. It's always a little hard being this vulnerable, but you know, we are in communication. So if I don't communicate my position, then you can't know that I need your help. So moving on from that, I decided to make an ad for Gillette. I was watching TV. I know, I still watch TV. I saw the latest Gillette ad, the one where they have Tom Grennan doing the track. He released it as a track a few months ago, but his version has been used, I think for almost about two years now. Gillette have been so consistent, well, bar that blip a few years back, where with their work, and I suspect if you say Gillette to anyone, the song, The Best A Man Can Get, will come into their minds and they will probably imagine what an ad could look like. Moments of men together, shaving, in the 80s of course it was just faces, now more areas are shown, and bonding between fathers and sons. I wondered, could I make an ad for Gillette, using these brand cues and the famous track? So on a bank holiday Monday, I sat down for about 30 minutes and made an ad. I'm going to put a link in if you're watching this. Of course, if you're listening to it, I'll put a link in the show notes as well. I'd love to know your your thoughts. What do you think? Do you think it works? This was made for free. Yes, this was made for free. I think this is a game changer for brands. And in the past, the playing field of brand creativity was really something you did when you had deep pockets. Budgets influence the reach, design, production values, speed to market, leaving smaller brands scrambling basically to keep up. And this shows that now the playing field is leveling out a bit. AI is democratizing creativity in a way that's re- really fundamentally reshaping the industry. Now, I'm not having a go at anybody here. I'm not saying that Gillette haven't done brilliant work. I made the point they have been consistent for years and they built up these consistent assets over time. The point I'm trying to make is, we now are in a position where the ability to create work and create work that was off the table is back on the table or on the table for the first time for so many brands. 
Platforms like Canva, which itself is powered with AI tools, have shown that design isn't exclusive to designers. It's accessible to anyone willing to experiment. I know schools use it a ton. It's brilliant. Video creation software like Runway and Lumen allows brands to create high quality videos without a production crew. Now, again, I'm not saying production crews are a thing of the past. I'm just saying we are making things more accessible. Now, I think some will argue that this will lead us to a deluge of boring and dull work, and it may, but let's just remember that Adam Morgan has found that 30 seconds of a cow chewing grass outperforms 50% of the ads on System 1's database. Most of these ads have been created with the help of an agency or that more traditional setup. Again, I'm not agency bashing. We all know the hundreds of reasons a great idea can, can die and become dull. I think now for small, medium-sized brands, the opportunity to create more than static ads is definitely here. You still need good strategy. You still need to understand the principles of advertising. You still need a media budget. But with AI, if you submit bland inputs, you're gonna get bland outputs as well. But this is really exciting, and I'll talk a bit more about AI as we go uh, through the, the newsletter. But I think the democratization of creativity and creative potential is incredibly exciting. And for what it's worth, I think I've started dreaming in prompts. More on that later, maybe. Well, Burger King's maternity ad, this was launched in September, but the debate rolled on into October. And I think it's a bit of an understatement to say there was a mixed reception to the Burger King ad featuring a mother after giving birth. There was actually a series of, of pieces of creative eating a Whopper. Now, as a man, is probably not one for me to comment on really. So what have other people had to say about it? Well, looking at creative review when the ad came out, there was a pretty positive review. But within a day, there was an article on uh, the same site asking, should it be banned? So on September 26th, Eliza Williams reported that if there's ever a way to build up an appetite, it's giving birth. And it's a truism borne out by a survey conducted by Momsnet on behalf of Burger King UK that the food you have straight after bringing a child into the world is particularly satisfying and delicious. Eliza talked about the charm of the piece and the fact that these were real pictures. So Burger King was leaning into something that was happening out in the world. I knew we had something special when we came across the images of real moms treating themselves to Burger King after birth, said Felipe Gumarez, deputy ECD at BBH. But however, within a day, Elisa was back on creative review and looking into whether the ad should be banned. Elisa saying that she actually found the campaign to be drawing on experience that felt true to life, that ravenous hunger that allows birth being assuaged by a burger. Arguments against the ads seem to range from exploitation of childbirth to complaints about the unhealthy nature of the food that is being consumed. Uh, anyway, some like Baby Central Marketing Associate Terry Lowe's called out a disconnect and suggest the team involved had no experience of childbirth. Now that seems like a bit of an assumption considering BBH London's MD is a mum. Tell me you've never just given birth without telling me you've just never given birth was the comment. Potent founder Rod Chance suggests that people with the issue with this ad were mostly the people it was not aimed at. People like me, men. The overwhelming outpouring of anger, he said, moral stances and postnatal health advice mixed with a decent helping of mansplaining was confusing to say the least. But when you look at the comments and reactions from women, you know, the people it was aimed at and who can actually give birth, the majority were either positive or uh, supportive or at least not morally outraged. Rod also noted that Burger King were saying, we're not saying you must eat this after birth. Anyway, it raged on uh, and, you know, some people made the comments that Grubhub ad was seen as a better execution. It seems mostly because it offers a woman free delivery on the day her baby arrives, actually offering that. Is that all it would have taken for Burger King ad to have been okay? So lots of opinions on it. Do you think Burger King and BBH are upset about that? I'm going to suggest not. They got lots of coverage. It made me wonder what other brands could potentially operate in the space so I created some ads versions of the ads questioning if other brands could have made them so the National Dairy Council Cheetos Liquid Death what do you think and of course it gave Michael Corcoran a great opportunity to eat a Burger King at 
12.08 and uh, make some comments about all the LinkedIn Karens and Keiths um, <laughs> giving out about the campaign. Uh, he does look like he's enjoying the Burger King, but he didn't give birth. So the next one's a bit of an unusual one for the newsletter, but have you seen Mr. McMahon docuseries on Netflix? Well, okay, so Vince McMahon is probably not universally loved, or maybe just not loved at all. He had to step down as the CEO of the WWE in 2022 after an investigation found that he had paid nearly 15 million to four women over 16 years to quiet claims of sexual misconduct. But that does not make the Netflix series fascinating to watch. In fact, look, his legacy is probably really, really tarnished. But when I was watching it, I was just fascinated how he was able to tap into culture. And it maybe it was because I had spoken to Dr. Marcus Collins for the podcast this month but he said you know he didn't always create culture but he was able to understand the narrative in the US particularly and lean into it with their storylines now look you look back at some of those storylines you certainly wouldn't go there today but WWF WWE was pure entertainment it's a show it would have villains and heroes with a story arc these things work but as the documentary shows it can get stale or you can get outspent by your competitors so how do you remain fresh building a strong brand that can withstand those challenges now i don't know if mcmahon had an innate ability to understand his audience or teams of people working on insight but over and over again he seemed to get it right when the brand was waning he found ways to rejuvenate it sticking to the core principles that you know he believed were for the brand which was about entertainment and leaning into the culture of the US and what was going on. It is a fascinating documentary, disturbing in parts, obviously, but I think from a marketer's perspective, to see how over the years he and the organization were able to move and keep a culture is fascinating. Well, Beyonce was out in her Levi's. The world's biggest star teamed up with the world's most iconic jeans brand, in my view. Um, now, you probably know that in April, Beyonce released Levi's jeans on her Cowboy Carter album. I'm going to be honest, I didn't know that. Um, so the lyrics were, oh, you wish you were my Levi's jeans. The scene seemed to be set perfectly for a partnership, or maybe it was already in play. At the time, it gave Levi's a nice jump in their stock price. They reported an 8% year-over-year increase in net revenues in Q2 and its 17% increase in the Americas. President and CEO Michelle Gass attributed the growth in part to Levi's prominence at the centre of culture. There we go again. But from the end of June, they seem to go into a bit of a freefall. There's definitely going to be a Beyonce bump from the work that they have just released it was called reimagine and there's going to be a series of campaigns where they will reinterpret several of the brand's iconic advertisements um the first being the iconic uh laundered ad um that they've reimagined and kenny mitchell chief global marketing officer of levi's said the levi's brand has and always will be the unofficial uniform for those moving forward in the pursuit of better, we believe a key part of that is continuously breaking and building the codes of culture. They're investing heavily with the strong creative team. The first spot was directed by a longtime Beyonce collaborator, cinematographer by an Emmy Award winner, winner, phenomenal photographer Mason Poole on the campaign. Like that's a huge investment, not to mention the Beyonce investment. So really interesting to see how it all plays out for them. I love seeing Levi's. I love seeing the resurgence. And of course, you can get your own uh, Beyonce collection on the Levi's website in the US. Of course, Sir John Hegarty, who would have uh, created the first ad, he mentioned at a recent event at the Marketing Institute in Dublin, how he was delighted to see uh, the campaign being reimagined. Of course, he would have been delighted if there was some kind of royalties that got paid out with that. But unfortunately, that's not how advertising works. Um, so back on to the topic of AI. And Mondelez have announced that they are leveraging in a major drive some AI-driven marketing initiative in partnership with Accenture and Publicis Group. The new platform aims to enhance consumer experiences by leveraging generative AI for personalized content creation, including text, images, and videos. The focus is engaging with all customer segments, especially younger demographics, to drive product growth. 
The platform will be designed with ethical and legal compliance in mind, ensuring that AI is used responsibly. John Halverson, SVP of Glover Consumer Experience at Mondelez, highlighted that generative AI will allow the company to quickly produce creative content while maintaining brand integrity. This initiative builds on Mondelez's existing relationship with Accenture. It's going to enable faster insights, apparently, more informed decision making across global operations. And Publicis Group will lead the execution of the AI powered creative assets. So we've talked before about um, you know, where agencies need to play with the technology and the use of AI. So it's really interesting to see, you know, obviously Accenture, Publicis Group, and Mondelez getting together to to use AI tools to do work faster i'd love to see some of the outputs of this and john if you feel like sharing i would love to hear from you well brian cox is definitely dining out on succession uh, he's popped up in another ad this time for uber eats and uber ride and he is leaning into his succession character again now this is a great piece of work from special us again the casting of the roommate is wonderful he delivers his lines so well there's a two minute spot and honestly it is so worth watching it's entertaining it is enjoyable brian cox is flawless and the message that they're trying to communicate lands brilliantly so i think special group are definitely proving that creativity breeds creativity and they are just a hot house for creativity at the moment and have been for some time. Well, I do love lists. There are two top 100 lists uh, out at the moment in the UK. First up, we have Marketing Week's Top 100 and then Campaign's Power 100. And UK's top marketers are, and I'm really lucky that I've interviewed a lot of people on these lists and have more lined up. So check out the list. And for everyone who's on the list that I haven't interviewed, watch out, I'm coming for you. Well, Dara Byrne shared this Adobe Click Baby Click ad with me when we were talking about leads. Now, Darburn is my brother. He's CMO of Softco. Can you imagine family events? Yeah, we just talk about marketing. Nobody wants to sit beside us. Um, but I've forgotten about this Adobe Click Baby Click piece. Uh, and when he shared it with me, while it did look a bit aged, I wonder had it just been released. Why? Well, because some of the things in the ad they're talking about, we are still facing the same issues today. Oh my God, it's terrifying. Do you know what your marketing is doing, was the question. When we think back to how complicated it was then versus now, wow, we had it so easy back then, but yet we were attributing everything to the last click. At least we know not to do that now, don't we? We do. We do, don't we? Have you heard of Nomad? I hadn't, but now I have. Thanks to Will Smith. Yes, that Will Smith. Anyway, he is in an ad for Nomad. It is a Brazilian product that allows you to invest overseas without leaving Brazil. This seems like a great thing. But what I was really impressed with and taken in by was the way he used technology to make the fresh prince speak Portuguese using his own tone of voice. I talked last month about what Meta are doing in this space and what it meant for localization agencies. Well, maybe the ship has sailed. Anyone at Nomad want to let me know about this? I'd love to hear more about it. It was LipDub that was the product they use. Check out the uh, ad in the links. Well, Sky Mobile has launched in Ireland with a campaign around expecting more from your mobile provider. I'm pretty sure I did something for O2 around this idea back in the day, so not new territory for a mobile network. But where Sky Mobile have done a great job is casting for the campaign. They've cast the man with the highest expectations, Roy Keane, the Irish and Man United footballing legend. What is great about this work, and this is something that Ema McCarthy talked to me about, Roy is part of the gag. He is leaning into his Roy Keane persona. Now, the other part about this is he has allowed the softer Roy to come through in the main piece, but also there's a piece where he meets himself, played by comedian Connor Moore, and it just really comes across incredibly well. I actually preferred the piece with Connor and Roy over the ad itself. I think the coffee shop piece may have had a bit too much VO in it. I'd love to know if it was tested with or without that VO. I'm guessing Sky being Sky, that they, they definitely did test. And Sky being Sky, they will definitely be spending heavily against this to ensure we all see it. It is enjoyable to watch uh, and people will be happy to see this one again, I imagine. The behind the scene and cut downs will work hard for them. And while this isn't a category with huge competition, really you've got Vodafone and 3 and then kind of Air and Tesco. 
at the end of Q2 2024, Vodafone had the highest market share of 35%. So Sky are going to be attempting to nab that market share through a price for life launch plan, offering new users lim unlimited calls, text and 5G data for 15 euros a month. They seem to be focused on the bill pay market and switchers and 18 chambers of Sky says that over 300,000 customers in the market are significantly overpaying on their mobile bill suggesting that the significant number of customers from other networks coming out of contracts that they hope to sweep up. Their proposition outside of the monthly price seems to be based on unfairness of contracts with other providers where you continue to pay. So it'll be interesting to see how many new customers they're able to sweep up and how fast they can do it. Of course, they're gonna launch with the brand work. It will be everywhere, but it is going to be interesting to see how quickly they're gonna to move to some very hard working acquisition work to pull in those contracts. I just hope they keep us entertained with more Roy Keane. So I'm not sure I can keep up. Hopefully these newsletters are helping you keep up. Hunt culture, that's a thing, who knew? Now, Andrew Tyndall, given I didn't know about Mudang, this may not surprise you. Anyway, the team at Little know all about it and are celebrating it with a new campaign to promote the Little Plus app in the UK with Martine McCutcheon. She was in that movie Love... Actually, yes, Love Actually, forming a retail mix of the 1990s Gina G classic Ooh Ah Just A Little Bit. You get it? Um, and yes, of course, they did change it to Little Bit. McCutcheon dances around the aisles showcasing the deals on offer at Lidl. The spot has been called a Eurovision tribute, which seems odd, or is Eurovision year long now? I don't know. It features more famous online faces, Gareth, founder of Hunsnet, charity shop Sue, the notorious bargain-loving influencer, and Diane from The Traders, whose downfall on the show was that she couldn't resist fizzy rosé. I had no idea who any of these people were. But it was fun. The ad was made by Cooter, so nice work for by them and of course then Lidl were out last week with their Lidl jackets uh, out of home ads which were great because they were placed right beside images of Liam Gallagher wearing a Lidl colour jacket. So it's been a bit of a bad run for Heinz lately just as Todd Kaplan starts there they've had to remove two print ads. Now I've actually really liked some of the recent print work that they've been doing. It's been really clear, great product shots and they were obviously looking to be a bit more enjoyable with their creative. They had an ad, a wedding scene, there's a family sized bottle of pasta sauce and the wedding party all of pasta in front of them and the bride is eating pasta but oh dear the sauce has spilt on her dress. The scene is over the top but there was uproar when this came out. So what was the problem? Well it appeared that it upset people that there was only three parents in the scene and the bride's father being seemingly absent. Some social media users criticised the advert for erasing a black father with author and guardian contributor Nels Abbey writing on X for my brothers and daughters because believe it or not black girls have dads too. Guardian readers responded in the letters section with Hannah Davis writing last year I married my husband he's white I'm black both his parents were present my mother was too my father died when I was 15 but he wasn't really in my life until that point. If he were alive, I doubt I would have invited him to our wedding. Do I think the Heinz ad is racist? No. Do I understand why people are upset by it? I do, I get it. But an absent father for me and for many others, not just black people, is a reality. We shouldn't hide that. I think the issue probably has to be the immediate reaction of a community and maybe less the social media up north. Nels saw this on his commute and was immediately offended by it. So it misses the mark, I think, because of that. I don't believe for one second anyone at Heinz set out to cause offence and I suspect Nels doesn't think that either. So how did it cause offence and cause Heinz to apologise? How can brands guard against that? I don't know how Heinz and their agency are set up, so I certainly can't shout about the need for diversity in their setup in the industry. The team that made this could be represented fully um, by those who are offended. So, a very difficult situation for Heinz, and they reacted well. But it did seem to get worse for Heinz, who did some work for Halloween that seemed to be a nod to the new Joker movie. Heinz Smiles, created in partnership with Gut New York officially, responds to the insight that Heinz fans go all in for Heinz, tattoos, weddings, you name it, and are unapologetic unpol about getting a little messy, challenging the status quo, and generally defying dinner etiquette for the great taste of Heinz. 
the trio of ad featured fe featured various fans with their Heinz tomato ketchup smeared across their faces. And Hannah Winterburn for Heinz in Europe and Pacific developed markets said, we've hacked a cultural moment using our distinctive Heinz personality and unique sense of humor to create something simple that speaks to the great taste of Heinz and seeks to entertain our fans along the way. We can't wait to see how fans react and hope to bring unexpected smiles to people's faces this Halloween. And Lucas Bongiani, Chief Creative Officer of Gut New York, says we're grateful to have brave clients who trust our team to spot these opportunities and deliver brave creativity. Well, it doesn't seem to have landed well for them. One particular image depicts a black man with sauce smeared around his lips. With some critics have likened to a minstrel-esque blackface, a racist form of entertainment made popular in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Have asked creative agency Annex 88, Chief Creative Officer Andre Gray said, how are we still lacking the diverse teams and cultural competency to have the semiotics of our in imagery properly scrutinised before it gets out in the world? This is how black people have been shown, characterised, stereotyped and dehumanised long before the Joker and much much more often than the Joker. And Antonio Lewis, creative director of Studio Resonate at SXM Media, said the creative should have been halted in its tracks to write the exhaustive process between idea and execution. Creative can't simply check off a few boxes, it must check them all, he said in a post on LinkedIn. Great creative should not perpetuate historical racism, it should not alienate audience and it should not be tone deaf to cultural sensitivities. It should not provoke harmful associations and it should not disregard the broader context in which it exists. A spokesperson for Heinz, Kraft Heinz told Pure Week UK that as a consumer obsessed company, company we are actively listening and learning and sincerely apologise for any offence caused by our recent Smiles campaign. Although it was intended to resonate with the current pop culture moment, we recognise this does not justify the hurt it may have caused. We will do better. We are working to remove the advertisement immediately. So difficult times for Heinz. And yeah, look, maybe it's just my positive belief. I, I don't believe that was intended, but they're really probably have to structurally figure out how they don't kill creativity, leaving enough space for a process, ensuring that work doesn't go out in the world that has the potential to offend. So the case for consistency is not new news. David Taylor of the brand gym has been talking about consistency consistently for years now. If you don't subscribe to the brand gym blog, you should. It's really, really good. I was intrigued by the new System 1 and IPA report about consistency. The report encourages consistency and I think anyone reading this would be hard pushed to disagree with that. Interesting from the brand gym, uh, there's evidence, it's about 11 years old now, that shows familiarity can be an issue, which is why they talk about fresh consistency. It's important to know what elements should be consistent. The System 1 report looks at 56 brands over five years in the IPA database and gives a score on, on how you can think about consistency. Now, critics are critical, as they were at the long short of it, for using the database and applying big brand rules to the many. Now, I don't agree that this is what the report does. I think it suggests ways for brands of any size to think about consistency and to start to understand the importance of it if they do not already. The facts are consistent. Brands are stronger. They, are generate, they generate more brand effects, generate more business effects. So consistency is something that we really, I don't think we should make the case for it. I think we just understand that it needs to be there. I think this report is helpful for marketers in any organizations, particularly though, if you're being asked to change all the time, because senior leaders in smaller business founder owners may be bored with what they see. So you'll be able to find the link uh, in the newsletter and you'll be able to take a look at the System 1 report. And next month, I catch up with Andrew Tindall and we talk a little bit about it. I tend not to have a pop at work. I talk about work that may not have worked so well and kind of the narrative be beside that as we've just talked about for Heinz, but I tend not to criticise anyone's work. I don't think it's helpful and I don't think anyone wakes up wanting to make a bad ad. It can just happen. But I did take a pop at Domino's in the UK in October for their stunt in front of Old Trafford with a picture of Eric Ten Hag, the Man United manager who's now gone, but at the time he was still in his job. The ad at home said, we are hiring, just not you, Eric. Now, the idea of a gag around hiring is not you. 
So this is not exactly fresh thinking. Look, that's okay. You know, we we recycle ideas. That's fine. But I think where this let itself down was the tone. The man was not out of a job. And where it gets worse for me is their statement supporting the work, where a spokesperson for Domino's commented, based on his performance, it can't be too long before Ten Hag is given the sack. We're gearing up for our busiest time of year and we, where we need people to join our team. We're looking for people who are results driven, so not one for Ten Hag, unfortunately. Honestly, I just think that's nasty. And as I say, Ted Hag has since lost his job. I wonder, does this please everyone at Domino's in the UK? So someone has been on to the supermarkets. Retro pop is in. So at the same time as the Martin McCutcheon ad is out with little S Club 7. Yes, S Club 7 are out with Waitrose to celebrate the retailer's number one range returning. It all works. It's entertaining. The song is a remix of the S Club 7 hit. I didn't know this either. You're my number one. I suppose the only unfortunate thing for Waitrose or Little is they're both out with something sort of similar at the same time. But I like this. It is fun. And I would love to know uh, from Nathan Ansel what the response has been to it. I don't know if you saw the post uh, about how Miro is using AI. I have known Paul Dervin longer than I haven't known him. That just makes us both old. But despite that, one of the things Paul has always done throughout his career is try and figure out what is coming next. Not just technology, but marketing theory, research. Paul doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. He really goes deep and figures out what is going on. We've talked a lot about the role of AI in marketing and advertising and creativity. We're and messaging each other about it and what we have learned. One of the things Paul has also done, though, is share a post on LinkedIn about how he is practically using AI tools with his team at Miro. It provides a step-by-step -step advice on how you could start applying AI into your work. And I think sometimes that is missing in some of the conversations about AI. Yes, there's a learning curve. There is a time investment. And Paul's really honest about that. But once you start, the potential for you, even as a team of one, to be able to generate creative outputs at scale is phenomenal. You need to know the principles of advertising, brand building as a foundation, and be able to critique your work and know what is and isn't working and why. But again, these tools are incredibly powerful. It's definitely worth a read and check out the uh, show notes for a link to it. So I've been thinking a lot about music associated with the podcast recently. Of course, that's what I call marketing is inspired by it now. That's what I call music and the kind of visuals around that. And I also found a 1980s album hits three would you believe anyway that's a whole other story and I was thinking about bringing a jingle to the start of the podcast doing something different I've just talked about consistency I know but I love what Giles has done for the Gasp podcast um anyway so I was starting to investigate this looking at obviously AI tools music creation tools and I test out a few genres and created a rock track on Suno and then took the audio and created a music vi video in Canva so I'll put a link in, in, in here for you to, to check it out. It, will it hit the charts? No, it won't. Um, <laughs> but it isn't really the point. I think music can be an incredibly fun and playful way to communicate a message. I was talking to an organization that is celebrating 60 years and quickly created a song for them that brought through some of the things that they might like to talk about and they could have footage from the archives. So again, this idea of things that may cost 10 or 20 grand to create previously and realistically probably would have very little business impact can be done in a matter of hours and for a fraction of the cost really mediocre outcomes this was a brilliant they do how to see their headlines a brilliant headline from mi3 in australia and it was with associate professor felipe thomas of university of oxford uh, business school saying that byron sharp and Ehrenberg bach's marketing science rules no longer hold they have a thousand campaigns, one million customer journeys as evidence with a peer review paper due out in early 2025. Now, Thomas is not the first to question the rules and their relevance today. Who is it that has been saying not all reach is equal? Professor Sharp defends his and the Institute's work, which is understandable. As always, we as marketers need to take this new evidence in and understand how we apply it. And John Lombardo won't like this, but in reality, it probably depends. So what's going on? Well, Thomas argues that Sharp's book, based on Andrew Ehrberg's work, is more about maintaining market share for large brands rather than explaining how brands grow. He said it is about how you stay big. He critiques Ehrenberg's assumptions of static markets and undifferentiated products. 
suggesting that these principles led large FMCG firms to be overtaken by more agile, differentiated start startups. Thomas' research shows that optimizing media for reach alone rarely leads to significant business outcomes. Only 1% of campaigns delivered substantial results, while most achieved mediocre outcomes. He suggests that marketers must go beyond reach and consider category-specific nuances and channel impacts. For example, TV influences 50% of personal care customers, but only 2% in the automotive sector. His findings highlight that not all media channels are equal, effective across categories, and marketers need to optimize media plans based on specific business goals rather than relying solely on reach. Yeah, you see, it, it depends. Uh, Thomas critiques the lack of academic scrutiny in Sharp's work, noting that concepts like mental availability do not appear in top tier peer reviewed journals. He hopes his upcoming paper, undergoing peer review currently, will shift how marketers approach media investment by recognizing that different channels and categories require tailored strategies. Thomas believes that the industry focus on reach sufficiency is outdated and risky. His research reveals that cross-media strategies, while dismissed by Sharp, actually enhance business outcomes. He urges media owners and marketers to focus on channel functionality and category-specific effectiveness, which could lead to better ROI, potentially up to 15-18%, to 18%, compared to the average sub-2% results from reach Based strategies. His insights suggest that media owners could charge premiums based on their channel specific effectiveness for certain categories. Ultimately, Thomas' work encourages a move towards smarter media planning, optimizing both reach and business outcomes through nuanced strategies that account for consumer behavior and category dynamics. It's going to be interesting to see the reaction to this. I haven't seen much, and normally you would hear a lot about this um, from people who are in the firing line um, and I have reached out to um, Thomas and to see if he would come on to that's what I call it marketing to talk to us so we'll see if Professor Thomas is available so TV ads are going to target households on individual streets I saw this on Dave Talon's feed before reading it, I assumed this was going to be US based, but no, it's in the UK where Channel 4 are putting plans in place where households and individual streets will be targeted with personalised adverts. I love this. They're going to use new technology which will allow brands to tailor who sees their advert, advert by enabling them to select demographic within a specific location down to street level. So, for example, someone watching Made in Chelsea. Oh, God. On channels for a streaming service could be served an ad for a fashion brand in a local outlet to them if a particular fashion trend is being discussed. Advertisers will be able to optimize their campaign by selecting from 26 program genres as well as time of day and device the show is being watched on. Their new ad targeting also includes more detailed data to track where whether a viewer has made a purchase after seeing an ad, as well as viewer profiles for brands to target. Fatima Dowlett, head of streaming and social propositions at Channel 4 Sales said, we're giving brands and agencies unique new flexibility to target Channel 4's young engaged streamers, tapping into the unique ability of broadcaster video on demand services to captivate and retain desirable audience. This is exciting stuff. So some more BBH London news. They posted new work for Tesco and my reaction was, ah yeah, Karen Martin, BBH in London is on fire at the moment. Within moments of that thought entering my brain, my LinkedIn feed was filled with views saying the complete opposite. Let's like take Pablo La Rosa. He said, I think it's a waste of money. Out of home needs to work and be understood in seconds as people pass by and its primary job is to help consumers recognize and remember the brand when in buying situations. And Misha Collins called it bland and confusing. Okay, so I wasn't expecting that. Now, thankfully, there were those on my I like it side and that they point out that you need to have brand codes as strong as Tesco's for this to work. So after 20 years of every little helps and those little blue lines, I'm sure there's a technical term for them, they have been able to do this. It's because of this consistency that they now have been able to deliver this out of home. Now, of course, the question is, while LinkedIn has been debating this, will it matter to the Tesco and non-Tesco audiences? Well, I think these are striking enough, lean into strong DBAs that it will capture attention. There's a playfulness to them. 
I know we can say if we have to explain something, it doesn't work. But I think at a base level, these are clearly for Tesco. So job done then. And then there's the playfulness that helps them stick with you. Someone much smarter than me, a man called Mark Ritson, you may have heard uh, of him. Of course, Mark, this is where you jump in and say, not at all, Connor, you too are smart. But he told us in Marketing Week that this was all to do with the Zagernack effect. I've probably pronounced that wrong, proving I'm not as smart as Mark Ritson. <laughs> and how the cognitive tension that arises from a task being unfinished and the need to keep the task in mind to complete it later improve the cognitive accessibility of the task in human memory. Mark points out that some other brands have done this. McDonald's being one, we often see their uh, golden arches being used partially to point people in a direction and it worked and we usually applaud that so what's up with Tesco? Why are people getting on its case? Well I don't know. I know Tesco are demonstrating they have a strong brand. And Karen Martin told me when we met that the Tesco CEO strongly believes in brand and he's clearly giving his team, people like Becky Brock and her team and the team at BBH London license to push and do great work. I say well done. So Guinness, according to Adweek, has the highest net favorability score of all beers. So it is doing well. Well, it's not gonna just sit there and do well. It wants to do even better. And it is now appointed on Common Studios New York, only a year old itself, as its US agency. The pitch also involved Forsman and Bowden Fours, and they are taking over from Quaker City Mercantile. Now, Diageo has seen a decline in sales since COVID, but its beer brands, driven primarily by Guinness, have increased sales in the 2024 fiscal year by 18% globally. And of course, we all know that it is the number one uh, beer brand and zero beer brand in the UK. So really interesting to see what we get out of Uncommon and Guinness together. I think the work that we've seen for Guinness so far has been good and we know Uncommon like to push boundaries. So it will be really interesting to see the work that comes out. Now, I grew up in the same town as Sharon Walsh and I went to the same college. There, the similarities end. Sharon has long been one of this country's most admired marketers with experience in United Distillers, Diageo, Coca-Cola, and in 2010, Sharon joined Heineken, where she focused on business growth through her consumer first approach. In 2016, she became global cider director at Heineken NV, driving the cider category, and then in 2020, returned to Ireland. And as she said, in her own words, was pushed out of her comfort zone into the position of commercial director of Heineken Ireland. She admits that this wasn't an easy time. It was challenging, but it certainly has paid off. As in 2023, she was appointed to managing director of Heineken Ireland. Now, Sharon spoke at the Marketing Institute of Ireland CMO Summit in October, where she accepted her award uh, for the marketing champion. And in the few minutes that Sharon spoke in that room, you can see how impactful she is, how super smart she is, and also how well liked she is. She's clear, compelling, focused, and you know she she genuinely seems to care about the people she works with. Anyone I have ever met that has worked with Sharon has only good things to say about her. So good things for good people. Congratulations, Sharon, and congratulations to the Marketing Institute on a great marketing CMO summit. Now, I'm not sure if I've mentioned AI at all in this newsletter. Have I? Have you heard? Have I? I think I have once or twice. Well, it turns out nobody cares. What? Paul Durbin, do you hear that? Mary Rose Lines, do you hear that? No one cares. What are you doing to us, Maddie? I have Chief Marketing Officer at Fiverr. Well, okay, so Fiverr come out with a really enjoyable piece of work talking about how AI is taking over the world and how nobody cares. The point really is, and they make the point, that it's the tools are the tools. And like any tools, the people behind the tools are what matter. And of course, you can find the right people with Fiverr. It is a great piece of work and uh, really enjoyed it, but we do care about AI, don't we? So is influencer marketing right for you? I love this. This is such an interesting topic. and. I'm going to be uh, speaking to CMO of Creator IQ coming up soon and fascinating. I love them as, as a brand and what they're doing in the influencer space. Um, well, that question was one that Dr. Grace Kite asked and answered on LinkedIn. 
And the answer is, well, if you are in certain sectors, influencer marketing is right for you. A YouGov survey of over 10,000 respondents revealed which topics influencers are most effective in promoting. About 60% of people find influencer content in travel, fitness, tech and fashion useful, making these areas strong candidates for sponsored content driving sales. Of course, these stats can't be applied universally in Indonesia. 86% of respondents find travel content useful compared to just 36% in Denmark. Grace suggests, and this is something I've seen firsthand, that for brands not ready for large-scale marketing, influencer marketing offers a cost-effective way to grow, similar to online video. And you can check out that on Dr. Grace Kite's LinkedIn page, a recent post in October. I've talked a bit before about how I would love everyone to get rid of their phones. Um, I'm not harking on to days of yore, but we spend far too much time on our phones and it is not good for us. Heineken play a lot in the music space and recently encouraged gigoers to ditch their phones and live in the moment. The innovative hidden message campaign used infrared technology to deliver a message invisible to the naked eye, but once you held up your phone to capture the show, a message was revealed encouraging concert goers to live in the moment. The message viewed through the ca phone camera needs no external app or web page to work. Heiken has even made their hidden infrared technology publicly available for any artist to use at their live shows. Wow, this is definitely a trend we've seen artists asking to put tape over cameras or put them into bags at the start of gigs. We're definitely hearing more and more of that. And it's interesting to see Heineken in this space. Again, they're really aligned with music. I do think it would have been a really natural place for a telco to have done something in and actually would have been a really smart move. Why more telcos aren't asking us to live in the moment is beyond me. I spoke to Marcus Collins uh, about how certain things, unexpected things permeate culture. And I don't know if you've seen the Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live skit, Domingo. It has just done that. It is everywhere. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It is phenomenal. Marcelo Hernandez even had to pause a recent stand-up show to get it out of the way and actually did his part of the skit. Maybe we were all just in need of some humour and that's why it connected. Honestly, I'm just glad no brand has tried to join in on the craze and the phase of Domingo. Let it be what it is and we'll just stay away from it. But again, it's really interesting to see how we can permeate culture. You may have seen I posted about this on LinkedIn in October. Irish airline Aer Lingus announced a new route to Las Vegas. And when you think about Las Vegas, you think big, big lights, big hotels, big bets. So Aer Lingus went big with some really creative special bills. The special bills actually had bus stops and they had the Vegas sign over the bus stop. It was really great. And they did a takeover of the sphere. It's great to see this investment from the brand and the work looked great. Inspired by Erlingus, of course, I decided to take over the sphere too. You can check that out on my LinkedIn as well. Now, I have mentioned the episodes of That's What I Call Marketing that we recorded in October and definitely encourage you to go back and listen to those. We started the month with Pete Markey and an episode called From Good Old Boots to Wow Boots. And of course, Pete is one of those top 100 and power marketers in the UK. Next up was the B2B power shift and what marketers must do with Andrew Hassiger from Green Ad. This is a fantastic episode about B2B marketing and how we are getting so much wrong. Next, we talked to the brilliant Dr. Marcus Collins, um, who's the author of The Brilliant For The Culture, about unlocking the power of culture through curiosity. Then we had uh, Mark Kingsley. Mark had been over in Dublin at an IAPI event and we got to speak to Mark all about how branding shapes perceptions in a changing world. Fascinating uh, guy to speak to. Really, really enjoyed that episode. And then we rounded out the month with an episode called Making Sponsorships Bloom with uh, Trevor Cohn, uh, Kira O'Grady and Trevor Hunt and we talked about all things sponsorship and how different activations and different sponsorships allow you to do different things and that episode was brought uh, in conjunction with Board Bia Bloom which itself is an amazing sponsorship opportunity. I say it in the episode I actually just thought it was a garden show it is so much more than that. Well listen that is it for this episode of the newsletter. 
what happened in the month of October. As always, I am sure there are things I have missed out on. Um, so do let me know. Leave a comment. If you disagree with any of the things I have to say, I would love to hear your thoughts and views on that. So from me, your host, Connor Byrne, don't forget there is a new episode of That's What I Call It Marketing coming out next Tuesday. Subscribe and you will not miss an episode when they land. It'll come straight to you. Of course, if you can take a couple of seconds to just give us a rating or reviewing, it is a massive help in terms of how we reach a uh, engaged community of marketers just like you. If there's anything I should be featuring in future newsletters, do let me know. Get in touch. That's what I call marketing at gmail.com. So for me, your host, Tom Byrne. Take care and thanks for tuning in.